Hi everyone, my name is Kimberly Francis and I'm a professor of music at the University of Guelph and it's a delight to be recording this for you here in Guelph, Ontario. I'm really looking forward to this concert and getting a chance to hear some pieces that I hadn't really thought about before or and some that I know quite well. So it's a wonderful concert. It's going to bring together um, a variety of different works that cluster around, well, perhaps with the exception of the Boulanger piece for solo cello. They're a group of works that allow me to highlight who Boulanger was in the late 1930s and then some compositional trends that even spread into the 40s, the early 40s and the Second World War. So without further ado, we're going to begin with a work by Peggy Glanville Hicks, who is one of um, the more famous of the women who studied with Boulanger. She herself was an Australian composer but she later moved to America and she worked there as a composer and a critic and a concert organizer. So she's this, uh, an example of, of a pupil of Boulanger's um, that had a very diverse career that allowed her ideas to actually flow of, along a variety of, of tributaries, if you wish. So we see in, in Peggy Glanville Hicks an example of someone who, who's, who could transmit Boulanger's ideas in a variety of different directions. Um, Glanville Hicks actually studied with Boulanger from 36 to 37 in Paris. So she was there at a similar time as Dino Lepati, who we will be discussing later in this, in this talk, who I will be discussing later in this talk. Um, and it also means if Glanville Hicks was in Paris and studied with Boulanger from 36 to 37, it's entirely possible that she was there when Stravinsky was co-teaching with Boulanger. Uh, Stravinsky uh, worked with Boulanger at the Ecole Normale and also lectured at Fontainebleau in the late 1930s. So it's possible that we're looking at a composer here who was a part of that really unique teaching situation. So that, that would be really interesting to imagine. Um, so this is going to begin, this work is actually a short play prelude and she labels it as pensive, but I also enjoy how it's, it's really inventive and bold. It's got a bunch of highlights in it and traits in it that characterize a lot of Hicks's own compositional voice and aspects that you can hear from Boulanger pupils. So the piece itself was written in 1958 and it obviously dates long after Peggy Glanville Hicks had stopped training with Boulanger, but there are some elements that I strongly suspect were highly influenced by Boulanger's teachings. Um, so the one thing I would point out to you for this particular work is how she uses counterpoint. In most of these works, I'm going to be discussing the importance of counterpoint. Um, so listen to how there's a, a variety of melodies and how their interaction makes the music quite beautiful. Um, and I'd also encourage you to listen to this, the chromatic possibilities that are opened up by certain of these choices. Glanville Hicks uses that Boulangerian technique of, of, of thinking of voice leading and, and its neighboring possibilities, right? And so you're going to hear us slide into these different chromatic areas at different points uh, that are wildly unexpected and, and exciting. So the next piece is Naughty Boulanger's Three Pieces for Cello and Piano, which dates from 1914. Um, and I was really interested in this piece for this talk because it's one I hadn't really thought about before in terms of Boulanger's output. And I think it's because, you know, I always kind of thought of it as, as more of a, a small miniature work and, and one that didn't include voice, which is always something that's so intriguing about the Boulanger sisters writing is their treatment of the voice. So it was really great to return to this work and think about it a little bit more. Um, I, I love the richness of the musical vocabulary in this particular piece. And I found it intriguing to think of a work that Boulanger would have written after her collaborator and you know, her champion, Raoul Pugnot, after he dies. So within this particular cello, the, these three pieces for cello and piano, we're going to hear a language that is, uh, it begins somewhat melancholy. Um, I hear here the influence of Gabrielle Fauré and, um, and also a wonderful example of Boulanger's sense of structural drama, which was something she, you know, um, 
emphasized so much in her teaching was a, a sense of, of long lines, right? And of, of structural purpose. So I encourage everyone to listen, especially to the end of the first movement where you see this optimism that emerges out of, you know, rather contemplative, arguably melancholic opening. And the final movement as well is really interesting for its textures and how it almost sounds like a Bella Bartok uh, string quartet. So there's some really intriguing writing happening in here and, and this dialogue between, you know, ebullient excitement and contemplation that I find particularly provocative given that it was written on the eve of the First World War and the whole context around Puno. Um, it had, when I was, you know, thinking about this piece, it actually led me to think about the blend between optimism and melancholy that we do hear so often um, in the Boulanger sisters works. Um, this sort of working through complex ideas that then emerges into a final statement of, of joy and faith and hope, just like we hear in Lily Blanger's Pied Jésus. So on a daring day, if I were pushed, I'd almost say that this musical writing, this, this formal design could be something we could say is quintessentially something the Boulanger sisters put into their writing. I don't know if I really think that, but I definitely started to wonder about that when I was listening to these three pieces. So the third piece on the program is going to be the concertino in the classical style by Dinu Lepati that was composed in 1941. Dinu Lepati was a Romanian pianist, a virtuoso widely regarded, or highly regarded, I should say, during the 20th century. He came to Paris in 1934 um, to study piano with Alfred Cortot, the wonderful internationally acclaimed pianist. And he also, um, Le Paddy also at that time was studying composition with Boulanger. So one of my favorite thoughts about this 1934 context is that Le Paddy would have been in the same classes as Igor Markovich and Sulima Stravinsky, Stravinsky's son. So again, what a wonderful, um, what a wonderful class to imagine, right? What a wonderful context to be studying and exploring the possibilities of composition. Um, we, have, we have quite a few writings by Boulanger about Le Paty. She admired his curiosity. She, would, she wrote about his, his desire to learn and how she admired that he was always seeking out those things he didn't already know. She really admired that as someone with vast amounts of talent, he didn't tire of always searching for that next thing, always challenging himself. Um, another really delightful anecdote is she spoke about how when he was a student, she urged him to find more time for composition. And it's um, something we hear quite often that she would suggest of her students. Uh, Sulima Stravinsky as well would talk about how she urged him to find more time for composition. She really did want to encourage people to create, to create music. Um, and so with Le Paty, she was urging him to find more time to write. And he actually said he insisted, according to Boulanger, he insisted he couldn't uh, because he loved the piano so much, which I think is just a really endearing anecdote. Uh, he, he, had to, he had to spend time with his instrument. Um, the other thing that I wanted to share with you is, and this is a direct quote from, um, from Boulanger's tribute to Le Paty after his death. She said, he who wishes to, she, quoting, sorry, quoting Le Paty, she says, he who wishes to write his dream must be infinitely awake. The great artist is he who relishes discomfort for whom an obstacle serves as a springboard. So that's a wonderful, a wonderful quote. Uh, Boulanger and Le Paty, did collaborate on a recording. So they recorded the Brahms waltzes, the Opus 39 together. And it's one of the few recordings we have of Boulanger playing piano. It's, I recommend it if you want to get a sense of that kind of particular performance style. There are those who would say it's kind of dry, but it also, it, it's, it's high modern, it's, it's extremely modernist in that it's um, the music. It's, it's cleanly the music without that sort of high romantic uh, indulgence of, of feelings, <laughs> as you were, uh, if you will. So um, yeah, they did record the Brahms waltzes together. 
And perhaps the greatest tragedy of the Lipati story is he died from Hodgkin's disease at the age of 33. So he died quite young and Boulanger would, went to visit him in Switzerland in his final days. So there's wonderful letters between Boulanger and Stravinsky when she's sort of describing his final convalesc convalescence and, um, and the conversations they had and how much it was about the beauty of music and the beauty of life and, and all of these things. So the piece that we're gonna to hear today from the pen of Lepati, one, I guess a work he actually managed to find time to write uh, is from right before he fled, uh, right before it's from the, it, it predates his fleet, his flight to Switzerland during World War II, uh, where he'd spent the majority of the war. So this is a work um, of a composer in, in Paris, uh, experiencing the occupation. One of the things I would I, I love about this piece, if you listen to it, it actually sounds as if Bach, Ravel, and Bartok all got together and collaborated um, and wrote this piece together and each took turns writing parts of it. The, the second movement in particular makes me think of the beautiful Ravel piano concerto, or even the second movement of Stravinsky's Symphony in C, which you know Lepati couldn't possibly have heard yet. It wasn't performed in Europe yet. So it's, uh, it's wonderful to see this aesthetic emerging on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, I also hear in this music box concerto for two violins. So you hear these different, uh, these different soundscapes being pulled together and synthesized into a palette that is uniquely Lepati's. Um, the third movement as well, what I would say about the third movement is to listen to there's there's this opening uh, virtuosic lightness that of course you know betrays um, a, a performer who knows what they're doing with their instrument right uh, so it begins with this really light virtuosic opening and this then gets scaffolded over something that sounds as if it was pulled right from the right of spring so these two different voices are happening at the same time which is just delightful it's a really wonderful moment so it's a squarely neoclassical piece. Pay attention to these shifting characters um, and pay attention to how Lepati is playing with these different, uh, these different palettes. Um, and then I, you know, I just wanted to say on a personal note as an oboist, I'm really <laughs> looking forward to this. So hearing this piece, um, the oboe has a lot of work to do. So good luck, whoever's in the first chair, it'll be really exciting to hear. The next piece on our program is Igor Stravinsky's Dumbarton Oaks Concerto. So the Dumbarton Oaks Concerto, which is also known as the Concerto in E-flat, it's, it's a fantastic masterpiece. And like the Lepati work, I'm really, in, I'm really interested in hearing these two works back to back. Um, we're going to hear another Bach in, in inspired work. Um, everyone knows Stravinsky um, very intentionally pulls on Bach's Brandenburg Concerto number no. three for this particular piece. Um, and this work is also so strongly connected to Boulanger. So Boulanger arranged this commission from Mildred Woods Bliss while she was on tour of the United States in 1937. And then when Stravinsky couldn't travel to conduct the work himself, Boulanger oversaw all of the rehearsals, all of the writing out of the score, everything um, to ensure the official premiere on May 8th. 1938 was able to happen and it did premiere the Dumbarton Oaks estate and that's partially where the name Dumbarton Oaks Concerto comes from. This piece uh, is, is wonderfully cheerful. There's there's that motor rhythmic element that we that is so you know so especially Stravinsky and that you know allows us to it, it sort of disrupts the Bach elements. Um, it's crystalline, it's clear. The textures are very, very transparent. Uh, it's, it's high Stravinsky neoclassicism. Um, but what I would say is that underlying this cheerful neoclassic classical repackaging of Bach is actually a very anxious, uh, sad man. Both his daughter, Ludmilla, whom everyone called Mika and his wife were deathly ill at the time that he was writing this. They were both, they both had tuberculosis and they'd actually, they actually were sent to the hospital. Their conditions were worsening. Six months after the Dumbarton's Oaks premiere, Mika actually dies. And then his wife passes the following March in 1939. 
So for much of the 1930s, Stravinsky was really uh, struggling. And in particular at that very tail end, he's struggling because of the ill health of his family. Um, so the other things, you know, the 1930s were tricky because especially after 1935, I mean, in part we have the conditions of the Great Depression, um, but Stravinsky's relationship with Nazi Germany would, he, you know, he was rehabilitated and he wasn't rehabilitated. It was a complex relationship there. So many of his performances and, and um, publications flowed through Germany. So the money was really drying up. Um, and so this, commission was important to him for financial reasons and for another uh, reason he had to pay his family's medical bills which were mounting. So we have this composer who's very stressed, very anxious, trying to get this commission completed for the sake of the money and all of these other things and yet you know we have Stravinsky who says his music is not autobiographical and so I would actually, having spent a lot of time with this piece over the years, I want to point out a moment, just a moment in the score, which I kind of read as a hint of his pain. If you listen to the first movement at the very end, there's a six bar statement, very short, and it's a rather mournful chorale. It's a bizarre way to end what has otherwise been this cheerful, upbeat, effervescent movement. And if you unpack the contents of that chorale, you actually end up with the building blocks of the entire work. And so when I listen to this piece, I admire it for all of its cheerfulness. And then I do wonder about those, that moment of pause where he chooses to bring everything kind of to a halt and sort of it, it create a different mood. So this chorale, just pay attention for it. It appears at the end of the first movement, it reappears in the second movement, and by the third movement, it's gone. And sometimes when I'm listening to this piece, I hear this as the moment where Stravinsky reveals himself, his struggles and his resignation. Um, as for Boulanger, as I said, she was the one who ensured the piece premiered in its intended time. There's this wonderful series of letters where Stravinsky's in, in Europe and Boulanger's in the United States, and he's trying to get things completed, and she's on the other side of the Atlantic saying, I can hardly see well enough, so I've had to memorize the whole score. I've got my students copying out the parts. Um, it, she just worked so hard, and so it was, in fact, her rehearsing. It was her uh, phrasing, phrase markings. She affected the work's articulations, the tempi. Um, she very much left her mark on this score. And so her copy, you can actually still go and consult her copy of the manuscript conductor score. And one of my favorite things is that the paper still curls up slightly at the edges. So you, you, you receive it and, and it kind of, it's bent. And it's because of Stravinsky having to roll up the score to get it on a boat and ship across the Atlantic in time for her to conduct the premiere. So it's a wonderful object in and of itself. The final piece on the program is by Arthur Honegger. It's the Symphony No. 2 in D major, which was written from 1941 to 1942. Um, the connection between Boulanger and Honegger is not as strong as some other of her contemporaries. They did both write criticism for Spectateur after the Second World War, which was a Parisian newspaper. So they were both contributors there. And they both contribute to a special edition um, in honor of Albert Roussel. So Boulanger's uh, contribution was in prose uh, and Honegger's was a piece inspired by Roussel. So they do have these interlocking connections. Boulanger doesn't write a lot about Honegger, but we do have one critical column by her from the 1920s. And I mean, at this point, she was a young woman. She was, it was, you know, directly after the First World War, she was walking a very careful line between trying to be a critical voice and also be embraced by the musical establishment and have a secure income at this point. So she very rarely says anything critical. And so it's interesting to see this column about Honegger. She speaks very positively about the piece. And then in a moment that's quite rare for her in these documents, she includes a, a paragraph where she says, eh, there's one thing. 
And she talks about how his orchestration lacked depth and she would have changed his orchestration. So I wonder if perhaps that was a moment that in some ways betrays a little bit of Boulanger's feelings about Onager and his music. For this particular piece, there are musical elements that really do link his symphony with the rest of the concert that we're going to hear. So this is a piece for strings alone, and it was written like the Le Pati uh, com composition. It was written during the German occupation of the Second World War, and it's meant to provide his audience with solace and contemplation about their, their experience and the difficulties they were going through. So you're going to hear in this work that opening, those opening uh, sentiments of contemplation and of melancholy and of, of anger. Um, and then in the final movement, you're going to hear, um, just like in Stravinsky's Dunbar and Oaks Concerto, you're going to hear a Bach-like chorale. And it's going to be, the melody itself will be in the trumpet. It's going to soar above the texture of the final movement. Uh, unlike Stravinsky, who used that chorale as a moment of sadness and contemplation, Onegger uses the chorale in a similar way to we heard Boulanger's piece earlier in the concert, where the final message is one of hope. And so Onegger gives his audience a final message, despite all of their anguish, that the occupation would end. And I hope that to your ears, um, that this is a message of hope. Um, delivered at the end of, of or, or at a point when people were longing for a better future, a brighter future. I hope to your ears, that's one that we can all embrace um, and take with us beyond this concert. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoy what, what we're about to hear. <laughs> <laughs> 